Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Today, we're going to talk about the pe insect pests of ornamentals. Some of the learning objectives that we're going to have for this presentation. We're going to try to figure out some of the common insect pests of the ornamentals that we deal with locally here in Cobb County signs of insect damage, the cause and the symptoms of plant infestation, and prevention and control methods. And when we're talking about prevention and control methods, we're really talking about problem solving. And probably one of the best ways to solve a problem is to prevent it from ever happening. So prevention's a real big one. Early detection, keeping an eye out on our garden, and taking a look, seeing if we can see anything that's going on. Correct identification, that's another big deal proper selection of control techniques, and using integrated pest management or IPM approach. And that's simply stating that there's usually no golden magical thing that you can do to fix your problem. It's gonna be a combination of different techniques and methods to manage the issue. Now, some general IPM strategies, crop rotation. This is helpful even in smaller gardens or ornamental plots. Remove plant debris or affected plants. So always try to have a clean garden. If you're your ornamental islands, when limbs and leaves fall off, try to clean them up, keep the islands mulched, use appropriate pesticides when needed. Plant resistant varieties, that one is a big one. Pruning, soil testing to make sure that your plants are getting the proper amount of nutrients. Insect and weed control, mulching. And also, if you really need to, you can even bring a sample to our office off South Cobb Drive, and we can submit that to our plant diagnostic laboratory, and we can determine if there are any specific diseases that you're dealing with. Now, when we talk about prevention, pest-resistant varieties is going to be one of the biggest ones. Soil sterilization is something that's used, but that's typically more for greenhouses and producers. Making sure you have clean stock plants, that's for everybody. So reminder, whenever you go to the garden store to pick up some new plants, whenever I do, I always grab it from the base and I pull it out of the pot. I take a look at the roots. I want to make sure that the plant looks healthy. I also look around the plant, make sure there's no, any, no insect damage, no signs of infestation. Weed control. Manage your weeds. Weeds are a big deal when it comes to having issues with your plants. Weeds attract unwanted insects. Weeds can help increase diseases, and they can also help get spores and moisture onto your plant leaves, which can promote fungal growth. Follow good cultural practices. Preventative sprays when necessary, and removal of infested plants or plant parts. Now, when we talk about some of the specific insects later, I may not always have that in the control methods, but I want you to always have that in the back of your mind. Maybe not necessarily the removal of the entire plant, but pruning is a great tool when controlling an insect infestation. Again, speaking of prevention, why would we use resistant plants? Well, one, resistant plants can be very attractive. They have a nice appearance. You're gonna use fewer pesticides, so that's gonna make them cost less in maintenance. Typically, they're native plants. They're economical and environmentally friendly. And they also set yourself up for success. Um, some people will just really want to plant something somewhere, but it's sometimes just not a good idea. And you're dooming yourself for failure before you start. Early detection. Early detection is a big one because typically when we notice an issue just by happenstance, that's after the issue has gotten way out of hand. So it's important to always take the time to go out and look at your plants, inspect them, see how your garden is looking, look at your shrubs, your hollies. I mean, I love hollies. They can hold up to just about anything, but they still can get insect issues and diseases. Here's an example of a holly with sooty mold. That's very unattractive. And that is a fungus, but that's a fungus that's brought on by the byproduct of insects. So I would definitely tell you, always look at your plants actively and also check under the leaves too for infestation. Early detection, some things to look for. Chew to ragged foliage or blossoms spotted or discolored leaves, twisted or deformed growth, death of portions or the entire plant, insect or insect-related products. Now we talk about insect-related products, we're talking about bits of scale, poop, 
um, egg casings. There's any number of things that you can be looking for, but evidence that insects have been there. Correct identification, especially if we're talking about insects, is very important because sometimes the presence of beneficial insects can help imply there's an issue, or sometimes we might actually mistake a problem insect for a beneficial one. Here's actually a beautiful photo. We have two lady beetles or ladybugs feeding on aphids. Over here on the right, we have a squash beetle. Now, for any of you who've seen ladybugs, you'll notice they come in a variety of color tones, but mostly red with black spots. Well, a lot of insects out there try to emulate them. Squash beetles are one of them. And to the untrained eye, they may think this is a ladybug, but that is not a friend. This is another great example. Know your beneficials. This is a predatory stink bug. This over here on the right is the brown mammarated stink bug, that one we all know and love and finds its way into our houses every fall and all throughout the winter. I don't know why. They're always in my house. They drive me crazy. But many of us might see the predatory stink bug, which looks extremely similar, think we've got a pest and kill it. Well, that actually feeds on brown mammarated stink bugs and also other insects that we don't want. So you're actually getting rid of a beneficial. Another thing always good to do is to conserve and encourage beneficial insects. Minimize insecticide use when possible. Use lesser impactful products or selectful pesticides when needed. Provide for the needs of beneficial insects. So putting out plants that produce pollen or nectar. So you always wanna attract the beneficials. That's always a good way of controlling pests and other problems and really keeping them from ever occurring. It's a good prevention. Lastly, when you do have an issue, proper selection techniques. It's always important to figure out how you're going to control it. You'll notice we have a couple of techniques here, mechanical or pruning. We have pre and post insect applications. So your pre's are pre-emergence or things that you're gonna to apply to your plants in the hope of keeping the insects from coming. Post is the things that you're going to be spraying when the insect infestation is already there. And then plant removal. Now, plant removal can be a tool as well, but typically it's not a tool we want to use if we don't have to. But sometimes it's just not worth it. You can throw a lot of money and a lot of time at something, and it's just not worth it. You just need to bring it out. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the specific insect pests we might see here in Cobb County. And we're going to categorize them by the type of damage that they do in our landscape. So first, we're going to talk about chewed or ragged foliage or blossoms. Now, a couple of things. When you see these holes in your plants, it's important to kind of take note of why they're there and how they look. That can be a good indicator of the insects that are causing the problem. So is there a pattern to the chewing damage? Are they chewing along the veins or in the leaf margins? Some insects only go after the juicy succulent parts of the leaf between the veins. So that can help us kind of categorize what insect is causing the issue. Excuse me. Is there evidence of mucus, frass, or insect droppings that you might find? So it's important when you see damage to try to think about what that damage is and also take note of it because that can help you identify the actual problem. And if you take note of it but are having trouble making that identification, again, that's why the UGA Extension Office in Cobb County is here. Give us a call. Let us help you. Now, the first insect we're going to talk about one that I deal with and get phone calls with every year, the orange striped oakworm. This one is a fun one. A lot of people will call our office and they'll complain about there's all these little brown or black little poop looking things that are all falling all over my deck or patio. First question I always ask, do you have an oak tree? They say yes. This is where it comes from. Now, mature orange striped oakworms are about an inch, an inch and a half long. They're black with eight orange to yellow stripes and two black spines behind the head. They're very noticeable. And in adult form, they're actually this quite pretty little orange moth. Now, a lot of people are always calling the office and asking when they fully defoliate an oak tree, is this gonna kill my tree or is this gonna cause a lot of damage? Now, I can't speak to the health of your individual tree, but I can tell you that typically if your tree is healthy, a single defoliation is not going to be that big of an issue because this is also happening late season when the trees already started taking a lot of the nutrients out of the leaves. Even a second defoliation is not going to be that big of an issue. And typically the worms don't reinfest the same tree. So the worms that mature and become moths will move on to another oak tree. 
If you have a third infestation though in a row, that's when you need to start considering some potential options of making sure it doesn't happen a fourth time. Because over time, this can continually stress your oak tree. Manually destroy clumps of young larvae when you can detect them. Especially if it's on a small tree, it'll be a lot easier to notice. If the infestation is going to come, but it's not that big yet, you can also apply BT. That is an organic, uh, it's an organic insecticide. It does kill the larvae if they eat the foliage that has been, that's been sprayed on. And they are safe to be eaten by predators. So if you kill a bunch of orange striped oak, or oak worms with BT and birds come in and eat them, that's okay. But BT only works when it's been sprayed on the foliage and then the worms eat it. So in situations where you see this limb right here where there's not really any foliage, spraying BT is not gonna do you a lot of good. In the case of really bad infestations and on the mature caterpillar where there is no foliage to spray on, then you might need to consider a contact insecticide. It's not my best option. I would like to try to catch and treat beforehand before it ever gets to that point. And you also have to think you would have to spray the entire tree. Well, oak trees get really big. So most people aren't going to go to the expense of getting a bucket truck to spray a tree from top to bottom. So trying to catch it early and manually removing as many clumps as possible is a great option. Whoop. Next one we're gonna talk about is the azalea caterpillar. This gorgeous little thing does go after a lot of other plants, but azaleas are one of its favorites. The adult form is actually gonna be an inch long brown moth called Deltana major. But the caterpillars are actually a little bit longer, they're about two and a half inches long, and they have a reddish brown leg head and the neck area as well. Excuse me. The body is black with rows of white to yellow spots. Now, sometimes those white and yellow spots as they mature start to meld together and look more like stripes. That can make identification a little bit more difficult. The larvae feed from the late summer through early fall and pupate in the soil over the winter. Now, azaleas obviously are one of its primary hosts. That's one of its favorites. But they have been reported on witch hazel, sumac, apple trees, red oak. They, there's a fair number of hosts out there that they will go after. Now, for control methods, observe host plants for signs of defoliation in the late summer and fall. Look for black caterpillars with white spots. That's the young, very immature larva. Handpick caterpillars from the plants when only a few are present. And apply BT if the caterpillars are numerous, but they're also less than three-fourths of an inch in length. Once they get mature and they're getting ready to cocoon, they're not going to feed anymore. So applying BT again is going to be irrelevant to them. Root weevils. Now, I will admit, I'm a little biased. Of all the beetles in the world, the weevils tend to be one of my favorites. Uh, just not this one if it happens to be in your garden. And this is kind of a double whammy insect. This affects you both in adult form and in larval form. Now, the larvae obviously are legless and C-shaped and they're white with brown heads. They typically stay in the soil and they're gonna feed off the tender feeder roots of the plant. And oftentimes that can cause immediate dieback of the plant and flat out killing the plant. Because what they'll do is they'll eat all the feeder roots and the plant literally will starve to death. You can notice them a little bit more in the adult form. Because the adult form, when they feed, they make little nodges out of the leaf, or when they attack the internal parts of the leaf, they make almost comma-shaped wedges. So that's a little bit more noticeable. So if you start seeing these weird breakage look, looking, eating, how should I say, bites within your leaves, that's indicating that you might have a root weevil issue. And the root weevil in the larva form is going to be the biggest issue. Now, they do host on azaleas, rhododendrons, strawberries, and other ornamentals, but they also go after greenhouse plants too. So this is also an industry problem. Adults can be controlled by insecticides, but it does need to be diagnosed first. Admittedly, when you have the small larva in the ground, there are larvicides out there, but most are not very effective. So this is one of those things where you wanna to try to catch it as soon as possible and try to control the adult population before they lay their eggs in the soil. Japanese beetles. Probably not a single person out there who has not had to deal with Japanese beetles at one time or another. Now, remember earlier when I talked about when you're looking at chewing and eating on the leaves and to take note of the way it's being eaten? Well, Japanese beetles are a great example. 
you'll notice how they're eating all the succulent green parts of the leaf, but they're leaving the harder veins intact. So when you see leaves that are completely skeletonized like this, that's a possibility that that's a Japanese beetle infestation. Whereas caterpillars will typically eat the entire leaf down to the hard stem in the center. Now, in early June, the about half inch size greenish copper beetles emerge to feed on plants and they'll feed on just about anything. But some of their favorites are roses, grapevines, crepe myrtles, fruit trees, There's countless plants that we get calls for. But they're also a double whammy too. The grubs overwinter in the soil and they feed on all the roots of our grass. So there's a lot of people who start seeing their grass browning out. That's potentially a white grub issue. Sort of a good rule of thumb is if you were to cut out going about, about four to five inches down in your soil during the summer and cut a 12 by 12 chunk out of your turf and lift it up and go through it, if you find five or more white grubs, you typically have a bad infestation. Now, controlling the beetles actually is fairly difficult when they're in their adult form. And you can go to big box stores and they sell beetle traps for Japanese beetles. Do not buy them. Buying them is almost like a running joke because the pheromone traps will actually attract a lot more insects than you have in your own yard. In fact, you'll actually attract all the other insects from all your neighbor's yards to your own. So if you really like your neighbors, give it to them. And by that, I mean, don't give it to your neighbors at all. Just wanted to clarify that. The best way to control Japanese beetles really is going to be with a residual insecticide that's applied to your turf grass. And you typically apply that in late August to early September. That's when the larvae are closest to the surface to feed on the grass roots. If you try to do it during the winter, they've actually burrowed down too deep in the soil to overwinter in the soil. So then the insecticide won't go deep enough or penetrate deep enough to get to them. Sawflies. This is another fun one. We see them all the time and we think that they're little wasps or bees, but they are not. They're just a good old fashioned fly. Now, the saw adults are not that big of an issue, but the sawfly larva can be. Now, they resemble caterpillars, but they are not. And I emphasize that. And that's because they have more than five pairs of abdominal prolegs, these little weird nudges you see down here. And that's an important factor when you think of control, believe it or not. The larvae are about a half inch to an inch long, and most have external feeders on foliage. Ugh, excuse me. There's a wide range of hosts that they go after, conifers, various oaks, roses, black locusts, azaleas, ash, walnut, elm, some other warning ornamentals as well. Now, small infestations when you're dealing with the worm, they can be removed easily. You can just pick them off, or if you see a heavy infestation on a limb or two, you can just prune that limb off and bag it up. Again, I emphasize pruning is a great control method. Larger infestations, you can use horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps. So those are both very good options to try to clear them out. Now, one thing you have to consider is this is not a caterpillar. So this is not something you can use BT on. So a lot of people will take their BT that they've got left over from their vegetable garden, from some other issue and apply it, and this will not be effective to them. These are not caterpillars. So I wanna emphasize that. Best control again, if infestations are bad, use horticultural oil or insecticidal soaps. But again, also you can just wipe them off, pick them off, or even light pruning. Slugs and snails. Now, slugs and snails are only an occasional problem. Not a lot of people typically have issues with them. And I don't, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of description about slugs or snails, because to be honest with you, I think we all know what slugs and snails look like. The best way of really controlling slugs and snails is really more preventative and cultural around your actual landscape. So slugs and snails feed during the day, or excuse me, I apologize, feed during the night, but they hide in places during the day to avoid drying out. So under rocks, under boards, under pots, anywhere where it stays dark, damp, and moist. So that's something to consider when you're trying to control a snail or slug population. Try to remove anywhere or eliminate places in your garden where slugs and snails can hide. And that way, they're not going to be there. They don't travel extremely long distances for food. So if there's not a place in which they can hide or they can get away from the sunlight or burrow underneath during the daytime, then you're not going to typically have a slug or snail population. So that's a great way to prevent them. Now, whoop, sorry. In rare case scenarios, 
if your infestation is extremely bad, you can get a mollicide. And they do have them out there. They call them usually snug and snail control. They don't call them mollicides because that just sounds weird. Because believe it or not, slugs and snails are actually, they're mollusks and they're more closely related to oysters and clams than other insects that we might be dealing with in the landscape. Now we're gonna move on to another type of disease that we might see or issue that we might see on our plants. And that's spotted or discolored leaves. Now this is usually caused by insects with piercing sucking mouth parts. So a minute ago, we were talking about insects that had chewing mouth parts. And yes, snails do have chewing mouth parts as well. But for piercing sucking mouth parts, we're talking about insects like spider mites, leaf hoppers, plant bug, lace bugs, thrips, aphids, white flies, even stink bugs also use piercing sucking mouth parts. The first one we're gonna talk about, lace bugs. I get a lot of phone calls about azaleas having damage every year, typically due to lace bugs. And they have this very nice sort of almost white discoloration that happens on the top of the leaves caused to them feeding on the bottom side of the leaves. Now they're extremely tiny and admittedly hard to see. They're about an eighth of an inch long and the nymphs are mostly black and spiny, but they're not easy to see at all. Now they, they affect a wide variety of plants, but azaleas specifically are one of the ones that they really go after. In fact, there's an actual species of lace bug called the azalea lace bug, which focuses purely on azaleas. But you can also find them on plants like Latana, Sycamore, Pisanthia, Willows. There's a number of plants that do suffer from them as well. One thing we always recommend, look for the first signs of damage on azaleas beginning in March and continuing throughout the summer months. Look for those early signs so that you can attack that infestation before it gets too bad. Now, azalea or lace bugs in general particularly like to go after plants that are stressed. The infestation is really bad. They'll go after healthy plants as well. But like most insects, they focus on weaker stressed plants first. So azaleas that are in partial, so plant azaleas in partial shade because azaleas do like partial shade to grow in. Azaleas in full sun, typically are almost always going to be stressed. And that's always going to be a hot spot for lace bugs. Now, when you do see an infestation, there are some insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils that you can apply to the underside of the leaves. That is something that you can use as a beneficial to control them. There are also a number of beneficial insects that are usually out there that will be eating on them as well. Now, if you're dealing with an azalea that's in full sun, and there's not a lot of beneficial insects that you're going to find on the plant, I typically tell you you're always going to have a lace bug issue and you may want to consider replanting something else or relocating your azalea if you can save it or salvage it. Another thing that you can do, again, heavy pruning. So prune out the infected limbs, trying to get to the good parts of the plant. See what you have left over. Now, mind you, when you do prune infected limbs that do have insects all over them, you want to bag those clippings. You want to bag them up, tighten them up to get rid of them. You also want to make sure you clean all the leaf matter off the ground as well. Spider mites. Now we're getting really tiny now. These are about one seventh of a millimeter long. Now, there's a number of different mites that we would deal with in a landscape. The spider mites, there's also several different varieties of spider mites that we might deal with. But the two spotted spider mite is one of the more common ones in the warmer weather. Now, the spruce spider mite, southern red spider mite, I don't get a lot of phone calls about them here in Cobb County, but they do exist. Now, once you can see them, which is typically with a microscope, they're pretty easy to identify. They have an oval shaped body and they have eight legs. They're in the arachnid phyla. They're related to scorpions and spiders. Now, there's a broad range of plants that they host on. Conifers, deciduous trees, herbaceous plants, shrubs. Actually, a lot of times when people think they have spider mites or they have dieback on their conifers or even junipers especially, a good telltale thing to do is to take a cutting that looks infected of your plant, put out some white paper on the table and smack it on the table. Take a look and see if anything falls off and starts moving on that white piece of paper. That potentially can highlight the possibility of a spider mite infestation. Now, the best way to really control spider mites is really trying to attract in beneficial insects. Predatory mites and ladybugs love spider mites. They love to eat them. That's a great choice. 
You can use horticultural oil and insecticidal soaps for low mite populations. Um, if the infestation is pretty bad though, and there's no beneficials in the area, you might need to consider a residual miticide spray, something that lasts a little longer and something where you spray it once and then reevaluate in a week and see how the plant's doing. Thrips, another extremely tiny insect. I really do think we're kind of going in descending order. We are really getting small here. Very hard to identify. Um, honestly, really only visual to most people under a microscope. Extremely small. They're yellow to brown to black in color tone. They have a wide range of host plants. Um, I can't even go into naming all of them, but there is a very large selection. In fact, one species of thrip shows a preference to plants that actually have yellow or light colored blossoms. But again, just in general, there's a number of them out there and they go through a lot of plants. They are hard to control. And they are hard to notice too. Pruning out infestated, lim infestated limbs is a good option. That's one of the ones I would definitely recommend. When heavy infestations develop, a contact residual insecticide may be your only option. But I would try pruning first, if possible, to try to take out most of it. Now we're going to talk a little bit about twisted or deformed growth. So this is, again, another type of damage to look for on your plants. And these are the insects that might cause that. Aphids, thrips, again, spittle bug, leaf mining flies, caterpillars, a number of different insects. Aphids. Honestly, one of my favorites. I love aphids. They're awesome. Just not on your own plants. They infest plants quite vigorously. They really love succulent leaves. I think I've dealt with them on my tomato plants just about every year except for last year. Um, easy to notice despite their size. They're really tiny. They're going to have a very usually oval shaped body. They're for the most part wingless, but there are winged and wingless versions. And they also have these little conical tubes coming out of their abdomen. Now, a cool little fact about aphids, aphids really don't stop eating. Even when they're full, they still keep eating. And what they do is they squirt out honeydew out of these conical holes in the back while they're continuing to feed. So they gorge themselves and continue feeding and just start pushing out good food to keep eating more food. A sign of where you possibly might have an aphid infestation besides the obvious is if you have lots of ants on your plants. Ants will actually farm aphids, almost like cattle, and they'll milk them for the honeydew. So, and they will even protect them too. So if you start you know, grabbing at plants that are covered in aphids, you might start getting attacked by ants. Another thing to look for is black splotches on the plants. So the honeydew that they produce, the byproduct they kick out, is a breeding ground for black sooty mold. Black sooty mold doesn't really cause that much damage to the plant other than if it's in a massive mount, it's going to keep the plant from photosynthesizing. But it is a good indicator you have aphids or some other insects, and those can be a serious problem. So definitely some things to look for. Now, when you're controlling them, I've recommended often, again, pruning. Um, this time, especially with plants that have large leaves, it's fairly easy to prune out the leaves that are heavily infested. You can also use horticultural oils or soap sprays, you can easily wipe them off the plant. So if you have, uh, I think a gentleman had a lemon tree recently in the home that got a horrible infestation and it didn't have a lot of leaves. The tree wasn't a very big tree. So it is a situation where you can realistically use a soap spray and just wipe the aphids off. If the infestation is really bad and also if these plants are larger and it's really just not functional, there are, insect, there are actual insect sprays that you can put out, but I would be hesitant to use them if I didn't have to, because they're also gonna affect your beneficial insects as well. The two-line spittlebug. Now, this is one that I deal with regularly on turf grass. One of the things I help a lot of people with in this particular office is turf grass. And this is usually one of those insect issues that we find commonly. It gets the name spittle bug because it produces this green, and I'm going to highlight here with my laser pointer, this sort of bubbly like mucus. And that's what the larvae are actually growing up in to stay, moisture, to stay moist and protected. But the adults, they're going to be black in color with these orange stripes on the wings. 
They can also be smoky brown. The nymphs are smaller, usually a palish green yellow. And two, they produce about two generations per year. So that means they can attack your grass twice, which is really not fun. Now, they can be found in numerous woody, the adults can be found in numerous woody ornamentals, especially hollies, not just your turf grass. So you have to be careful. They're not just going to be on your grass, but they can also be on some of your woody ornamentals. For control, because they're usually in such a widespread population and they can travel, time insecticide treatment to heavily infested areas of your turf in July is the best option. You can also mow and irrigate your grass several hours before applying the treatment for best effect. And you typically want to do that late in the day. So for, as a good point, this sort of brings into it. If you need to apply an insecticide on your turf grass, a good rule of thumb is to always do it later in the evening. The reason you would do it then is that's when most of your beneficial insects, especially your pollinators, aren't out and as active. That way they're gonna be less inhibited or less affected by the insecticides that you're putting out. That's just a good rule of thumb. Holly leaf miner. Now by its name, obviously it infests hollies. This is, the adult is actually an invasive, non-native black fly. But the larva, they're really tiny. They're about an eighth of an inch long. And they are actually going to burrow through your holly leaves, mainly in the succulent areas, along the vein and they're gonna be feeding off of it. Now, light infestations can be easily controlled with pruning. This is something easily noticeable and cut out. Heavy infestations are gonna to have to be controlled with a systemic insecticide. And that's typically something that you're gonna do through March to late summer. Contact insecticides may be used for adults in early May, but this is the least desirable technique because beneficial parasites may be killed. Now, the last group we're gonna talk about on the damage they produce is complete or partial death of the plant. And we're gonna talk about some beetles, moss, and scale insects. Euonymus scale, it's infamous. And as one person once told me, where there's euonymus, there is euonymus scale. Now, this is also considered a hard scale. To describe that, scale being a small insect with hard scale, when they find that beautiful spot on the stem that they want to dig into and feed on, they harden their shell and they literally seal themselves to the plant. Once that's done, you really can't remove them off the plant. And they're, al they're almost impervious to any sort of external chemical application or even physical removal. There's not a whole lot you can do once they've burrowed down onto the plant. Now they do have a mobile stage or what they call crawler stage. And that's when the best control is possible. That's when they're very susceptible to contact sprays. You can even just wash them off at that point. But they're called hard scale for a reason. Once they harden up, they form a sort of a brownish black oyster shaped shell that they cover themselves with that's really holding and protecting them down. Now, the damage that they produce on euonymus looks very similar to the damage that you'd see from lace bugs on azaleas. It gives you that almost like white patchworky webbiness looking on the leaves. So fairly easy to spot. If infestations are bad, I would suggest pruning, um, pruning and bagging up the clippings. Also picking up all the leaves. They can fall down on the leaves, especially the larva, and go back up on the plant, cleaning all the leaves out from underneath the plant. And if it's a real bad infestation, you can do, there are, there are some uh, systemic insecticides that you can apply, but typically if the infestation is really bad, it's just easier to remove the entire plant. And when you do that, you really want to remove the entire plant and bag the entire plant up. You also want to make sure that after you've gotten rid of the plant, you clean up all the plant debris on the ground, all the plant material, really try to make it nice and start with a brand new bed. And in that situation, you want to plant something very different from a euonymus so that you don't have the chance of them growing up on that as well. Now, wax scale is a soft scale. So soft scales never form that hard outer shell that hard scales do. So they're a little bit more susceptible to some contact insecticides, even in their adult stage. Now, 
Wax scales in the adult form, they're about a quarter of an inch in diameter. They have a reddish color, but what you usually see is this big gummy white wax stuff they produce on top of themselves. And they have really kind of almost unique, I would almost say starfish slash snowflake shaped nymphs that you see here all over the leaf as well. Kind of cute. Um, if you start seeing large numbers of bees, wasps, hornets, ants on your shrubbery, that can be an indication of wax scale because one of their byproducts, just like aphids, is honeydew. And then you can also see sooty mold. So that's when you start seeing black tarnishing on your leaves. That can also be an indicator of wax scale. Now, crawlers begin hatching in the early summer and removal of heavily infested twigs and branches is pretty easy. Lighter infestations, you can spray thoroughly with horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. Um, if the infestations are really bad, you can use a systemic insecticide after the eggs have hatched, when the crawlers are present on the plant, and that's when you're gonna get your best control. Asian ambrosia beetle. Now, realistically, you will never see the Asian ambrosia beetle. The Asian ambrosia beetle is really tiny. I've dealt with it a number of times and there's a number of different varieties that you might find here in Georgia. One of the things that you will see, however, is signs of it. So if you see maybe wood pulp or wood powder around the base of your tree, or if you see these very stylish little toothpicks sticking out of your tree, that's a sign of ambro Asian ambrosia beetle. Now, a lot of people always want to know what sort of insecticide or what spray can they spray to kill the beetle. And there are some preventative sprays that you can spray. And unfortunately, you have to do it very repetitiously in order to keep the beetles from attacking your plant. But it's important to kind of understand how Asian ambrosia beetle actually kills your plants or kills your trees. What they do is they burrow into the soft wood to lay their eggs. And they make these very unique little tunnels on the inside of the bark. They scoot out and push out the wood pulp, and you see those little toothpicks. But that in and of itself is not actually what causes damage, or the massive amount of damage, or primarily kills your tree. They actually carry spores of a fungus on the back of their outer elytral wings, and that fungus grows up within the inside of the tree, and that is actually what the larvae feed on when they grow up to maturity. It is that fungus that shuts down the xylem and phloem of the tree. It's literally shutting down the entire circulatory system of the tree. That is what kills your tree. So admittedly, if you have a heavily infested tree, and spraying an insecticide is not necessarily going to do any good whatsoever because the tree still has the fungus in it, and it's on the inside. So spraying a fungicide is not going to be effective. And the problem is kind of can be easily too far gone. Now, some varieties of Asian ambrosia beetle focus on new growth limbs, I've seen this commonly on magnolia trees where a client might have one or two small new growth limbs that have turned brown, but the rest of the tree looks fine. And in those situations, you won't see these little toothpicks sticking out either. But those are that's something that can be taken care of. And usually if you look hard enough at the going back from the death of the tree or the limb, you can see a tiny little hole about the size of pencil lead. And that's where it burrowed in. And what you'd want to do is prune your limb about two inches past that hole back toward the tree and bag and remove that limb. Now for trees that are heavily infested, so trees that like cherry trees, crepe myrtles, pecans, peaches, plums, dogwoods, persimmons, sweet gums, Chinese elms, and unfortunately Japanese maples, if you start seeing a lot of toothpicks and heavy infestation, there's not a whole lot you can do. The best thing you can do is prune the tree, or not prune, excuse me, cut the tree down at the base and bag it and remove it entirely off your property. You don't want to chip it up or mulch it up because that's going to leave the chance that the beetles actually might still be alive and fly to another tree. Now, aside from the potential of using a somewhat effective preventative spray, which I, and I would say only somewhat effective, one of the things that you can do is try to focus on the health of your trees and plants. Um, this, and this goes really across the board. Most insects prefer stressed plants first. A Asian ambrosia beetles are no different. So making sure that your trees are happy and healthy reduces the chance that they'll actually get attacked by any sort of insect, including Asian ambrosia beetle. 
So doing a soil test, making sure you're watering appropriately in drought situations, all that is extremely important. Tent caterpillar. Admittedly, I debated having this one on here because for the most part, other than the very unsightly tents they produce, they don't really cause a whole lot of an issue. They're just aesthetically displeasing. Um, they rarely ever defoliate a tree to the point that it's not going to come back, similar to your orange striped oak worm. Now, typically, if you do see these tents, the easiest thing to do is just prune them out. If you want to, or if you want to get your hands dirty, you can go ahead and go in there and grab them and pull them all out and put them in a bag or throw them away or break the web up because the whole reason the web exists is to actually keep out predators like birds from eating them. I've done that actually. I had a tent caterpillar set up shop in a sweet gum in my front yard. I broke up the tent and I had no caterpillars by tomorrow. But I probably had a lot of very full and fat birds. Now, host trees, realistically, there's a very wide variety. So I don't have a list for you to look at because there's a whole bunch of trees that they'll go after. Um, when you, the, as far as control, you can look for the black eggs that are about three and three quarters of an inch long in masses and you can prune those out during the tree's dormant season. But typically, again, mechanical pruning, destroying of the webs, these are the best ways to get rid of it. You can time insecticide applications for the presence of the young larvae if you want to. They are susceptible to BT. So if you do see them out and actively feeding, you can put BT out on the leaves and they will ingest that and die as well. Mealybugs. Another extremely tiny insect, but noticeable because of this white and fluffiness that you see around them that's not only part of themselves, but some of the excrement that they produce as well. Adults are about an eighth of an inch long, so really small. And the body margin is ringed with white wax filaments. The longest ones are at the very end, which are typically longer than the entire body. Now, mealybugs really go after plants, usually in protected locations. So hollies, yews, rhododendrons, prosanthia. But they're in places that are getting lots of shade. And plants are typically stressed when they're getting too much shade. And this is a place where they really like to go. Also, like aphids and other insects, one of the byproducts they produce is honeydew. Honeydew can also produce sooty mold. So these are things to look for. Again, if you see black sooty mold on your leaves, then you have a plethora of insects that it might be, but that's a good first sign indicator. Mealybugs will be found on the other side of the leaves, just like lacewing bugs. Using a dormant oil spray will reduce the overwinter. Excuse me, I apologize. Too much talking, not enough water. Dormant oil spray will reduce the overwintering populations. Selective pruning and summer oil sprays will suppress growing populations. And systemic insecticides are preferable if plants are dense and if the pest population is high. Now, I'm not a huge fan of systemics, um, depending on which one you're using, but I would tell you that proper identification is key here. If you see sooty mold, but you're not sure why it's on your plant, call our office, send photos. We can identify the issue and tell you exactly what you need to do. Because I'll admit, even though there's a lot of mechanical aspects that you can do to try to control these insects, insecticide applications vary from insect to insect. So the insecticides used for mealybugs is not necessarily the same one you're gonna use for lacewing or the same one you're going to use for aphids. So that's why, again, proper identification is key. White flies. Don't worry, this is the last insect I'm going to talk about today, but it's also a very common one we deal with in our office. Adult white flies range from 1 16th to 1 8th of an inch in length. Most species resemble tiny little white moths. Again, huge plethora of plants that they can host on, but typically when people come to our office, they're usually dealing with gardenia, rhododendron, azalea issues, and sometimes on the larger side, dogwood issues as well. Now, to try to control them, the first thing you want to do is under, examine the underside of the leaves when honeydew or sooty mold is present. Um, also, if you see yellowing of the leaves, that can be a good indicator. Be sure to rake up and destroy all fallen leaves. If the honeydew or dam if the if the damage or the honeydew itself, the sooty mold that's produced that grows on it is just too undesirable, you could consider heavy pruning as well. 
Um, you can also spray the underside of the leaves with soap or oil to conserve beneficial insects. That's an easy way to just wipe them off, just like you would with aphids. Remove heavily infested leaves and prune to improve air circulation in the plant. The air, better air circulation typically will keep them out. Predators and parasites usually keep these pests at low levels in the landscape. In a nursery application of systemics is usually needed. Um, insecticides, or in, to, insecticides or insect growth regulators may be required because in a greenhouse setting, which is very choice for whiteflies, they tend to grow exponentially and infestations tend to get out of hand very quickly. And also, if you have an entire plant population that you're trying to hopefully put to market, you need to completely kill them and you don't want to throw away all the plants that you've worked very hard to grow. Now let's backtrack a little bit because I know I talked about a whole lot, more than I even remember. Insect-related byproducts. We mentioned that at the very beginning, but things to keep in mind. Honeydew. Honeydew brings sooty mold. If we see sooty mold, big black patches on our leaves, that's a sign of insects like aphids, soft scale, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, white flies. It's a number of different insects that it can indicate. Dark fecal matter specks. That can be lace bugs, greenhouse thrips, plant bugs. Some of these, mind you, I did not talk about, but that's to be honest with you, I could not talk about all the pest insects in one presentation. Tent webs, tent caterpillars, obviously, or web worms, or leaf rollers. And spittle, that's just spittle bugs. Other insect related products, look for cast skins. Now, aphids and leaf hoppers and lace bugs, particularly, you can see the castings of old skins. And also, one thing that's not on there is scale. You can typically see the old castings and remnants of scale on plants as well. So that's a good thing to look for. Um, cottony, waxy material, mealy bugs, scale, aphids also will produce that. There's one type of aphid that's actually called the woolly aphid that looks almost fuzzy and white. And it stands out. And a lot of people mistake it for other insects because it's all fuzzy and white and moving around. A lot of people might think it's a mealy bug or they might think that it happens to be some sort of weird type of scale. And also looking for slime. That's a very good indicator, obviously, of snails or slugs. Now, some good resource links to look at. There's a bugguide.net is a great resource for bug identification, especially for bugs all across the state. Insect Identification Guide of Southeastern Landscapes. That's one of our UGA publications. I would highly recommend downloading it and flipping through it. It's a really nice read. And then Control of, of Common Pests and Landscape Plants. That's another very good read. And these are two almost must have publications for any gardener who does ornamental gardening in their lawn. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching. And please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.